honestly one of the biggest things I say to my friends and people is we got to stop complaining this this country how bad do people think it is is better than a lot of countries in terms of opportunities I just gave an example earlier it cost ten thousand pounds to start a business in Dubai how much does it cost here to start a business you register companies ass a few quid and you're done the biggest deal I've done to life today in, from an asset point of view was the commercial deal that you helped me with I give break the numbers down for you I bought that for 140 applied for planning permission tenanted as well cash flow from day one applied for planning permission with the well-known architect that we all use uh, within Birmingham he did, done me a, done a really good plan approved in three months bank just valued it Adam while still in your 20s how do you build a five million pound businesses across two countries across the UK across Dubai as well in just a few short years how's that even possible um, there's a secret recipe to it <laughs> Um, no, it's it's actually very simple, but hard work and discipline has got me there, right? That's how oh, I think people don't like to hear it yeah. requires hard work. Hard work and discipline, that's yeah. the most key thing. Discipline, waking up every day and doing the same thing day in, day out to get the results over over five years or four years. Yes. Yeah. So it's been like a four or five year journey yeah. uh, in terms of get to where you are. So just give us a quick synopsis of kind of the current situation. Where where are you at the moment in terms of this? So, so my story is basically started four years ago in service accommodation and we call it holiday homes in Dubai. So now we're international in Dubai, in the UK, um, three, three cities in the UK, Birmingham, Liverpool, Glasgow. Fully managed by my team. I have a very really great team, cleaning team, maintenance team, operational team. So we started this four year ago just with me. I was just me, one property, two thousand pounds. I think I started with not much money, uh, not much money needed to get started. So it's not as though you had a huge amount in the bank to say, right, I'm I'm kind of starting this. Yeah. yeah so if I, if I want to just take a step back in my story, I had a corporate job which was very well paid, and I was really happy. And I, but I wanted a bigger challenge. I wanted something vision. I wanted to create something visionary. I wanted to create something what I have now. Like I have more bigger goals now, but I wanted this where I'm sitting yeah. here today, be able to sit across you, someone like you and be able to have these conversations. So started four years ago with just 2,000 pounds, one rent to rent um, in service service accommodation in Jewelry Court in Birmingham, just down the road. Right. Um, you know, from there, I built relationships. I built rapport, marketing, uh, sales, everything under the roof that needs doing. I did it all. Wear all the hats. Yes, correct, yeah. And, and sales and marketing is really important. You know, going out, putting yourself in networking events, coming to you, I came to. I think I came to every single one of your networking events. Met some great people. Um, God, this is going back in 2018. Um, so yeah, from there, because I put the hard work in, one property turned into two. The two turned into four. The four turned into eight, because the the way it happens, people don't believe in this. You got to believe in it. It's that one landlord knows another landlord, or he doesn't tell you on the day one that he has another five properties, and then he sees the results in six months in a year that you pay rent on time. You take care of his property. Uh, so if you're doing rent to rent, for example, you take care of your property, you stick by your promises. He says, oh, I've got another 10 properties or I'm buying another 10 properties yeah. uh, in, in, in the city center on Broad Street or what, whatever. So that's the secret to my growth. I just went in every single day, talked to everyone, told everyone what I do. You got to tell everyone what you do. Yes. Um, plus, like now I've, I have a social media manager to to tell everyone what I do because I do. So it's a difficult thing. Share the thing. journey. Share the journey. So yeah, that's the start of my journey. Yeah. So when it uh, when you look at uh, what you were doing previously, because you uh, engineer by background, so mm -hmm. left university and uh, as a Jaguar Land Rover, correct? You yeah. had management role. Mm -hmm. So what sort of salary package were you on at that time when you when you left to do this full time? So I was twenty six, just turning twenty seven when I left to do this 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 uh, property or mm -hmm. entrepreneur entrepreneurship. I was in Jaguar Land Rover as a say a consultant engineering management. I was on an 80,000 plus K salary with yeah. a, a brand new Range Rover every every six months. That's the package they give you. Every six months you can change your car. It's a pretty good life to live with a company credit card flying. I worked in Shanghai for two years. Yeah. Business class flight, free, everything covered, dinner, food, uh, travel, accommodation. Can't ask for something better. So it was a nice life that you had in your 20s, but you you could see that more was possible Correct. But you made the difficult choice of actually, I'm going to pursue that. Yeah. Because so many people in that position where they're earning really good money, great lifestyle, mm -hmm. and they want to do more. They don't want to just keep doing the same thing for somebody yeah. else. Yeah. But they just never make that step. Yeah. And I think 
for me, it was, I worked out the why, and you probably know this, What what's your reason? Yeah. Like some people have, you know, kids as as their reason. Some people have X, Y, and Z, and maybe money or maybe freedom. Mm-hmm. For me, it was like, look, I want this lifestyle where I can travel, where I can be free, a lifestyle freedom, um, but still be working. I don't want to retire. Like I'm not a guy, I'll retire at 30. I think that's the worst line people have come up with because when you retire, you can't just sit on the beach. It doesn't work. I'm I'm actually evidently sitting on the beach last weekend, <laughs> the weekend before. It's not that fun. Like it gets boring after a while. Yeah. So you want to have something that you're driven towards or you you, you strive to achieve something bigger. So I'm very ambitious. Um, and when I got to a certain level in management in Jaguar Land Rover, said, you know, it's good to have 80,000, 90,000, 100,000 with a nice Range Rover. You yourself have a Range Rover. You know, after six months, it's just a Range Rover, right? Then maybe you want a Ferrari or you want to, okay, money is a tool to get to those positions, but are you really going to be happy or enjoy the journey for the next? Because it takes, I think in a corporate job, probably takes to take me another 20 years to get to the director position. Yeah. I wasn't willing to wait 20 years to become a director. I wanted to be where I can make decisions, where I can have the freedom and still have that Ferrari or the or the Lamborghini or or a life on the beach that people strive for. So, so that's why There must have been some time where you were, you had some doubt that actually if I leave this well-paid job mm-hmm. to go and pursue this mm-hmm. dream, ambition, as become an entrepreneur, it may not be a smooth journey. So it might be safer to stay where you are yeah. than take that leap. Of course, that's human nature and we can't fight that. We have to, for me, it's risk, risk mitigation. Again, I learned this in the corporate job and I always say this to people, learn as much as you can if you're a doctor, engineer, uh, astronaut or a teacher, just learn because they have skills to teach. These and the transferable, transferable skills. Those skills can be used elsewhere as well. Yeah. So what what I learned was one of the things, one thing called in engineering is risk management or risk mitigation. So when I was transferring from my current job, which was very well paid, very safe, security, I can just get married and just have a really lovely life, nice house, um, you know, a five bedroom house, I can have a nice car. But I said, look, I can, I don't want to lose all of this at the same time. Let's risk mitigate this. Let's, let's work out what I need to do to get from point A to point B, right? Okay. So let, let's, let's spend my weekends. So Saturday and Sunday, I will go out and look for deals. Uh, or maybe on the weekends, uh, or maybe on the on the on the weekdays in the evening, I will look for deals, ring up landlords, uh, ring up agents uh, to get the X or Y. So these are these are rent to rents you're looking for. The- these are rent to rents, right? I, for me, I did a couple of things. I'd like to put my hands in uh, all the jars, right? So I've got buy to lets, I've got commercials, um, which we we I can tell you more about. But the first thing was rent to rent because it was less investment in terms of money, yeah, right, less risk. Um, and I said, look, okay, let's do this. Easier to get. You can do a deal in one week, mm-hmm. right? If you really put your head down, uh, instead of buying a sh- buying a shop or something, it'll take you eight months, six yes. months. So I put my head down. I said every weekend or in my downtime in the evening, you know, I'm going to make this call. I'm going to do this reach. I'll make my website to re- register my company. Mm-hmm. Register my company in 2018. I was still working. So this is my risk mitigation. I was still working on the side of register my companies on Companies House in 2018. Worked for a year and a half uh, just before COVID. I left and I worked hard until I can actually get near the salary. I didn't get near 100% near the 80 grand salary, but I'm like, okay, I'm comfortable to live yeah. for my rent to rent. So you got to a point where there's enough money coming in from yeah. the business now yeah. that I say, actually, I can live on that. Correct. Yeah. It's not the same lifestyle, but yeah. I can live on that yeah. whilst I can do the building. Yeah. That's when you moved. So, so yeah, the secret is transfer transferring from a corporate job or any job you have is the risk mitigation don't I always say don't ever leave your job just because you've seen a reel on Instagram where he says, Oh, entrepreneurship is good. Yes. <laughs> who's gonna pay the bills? Who's gonna pay the energy bills for five grand a five grand a year now? So you touched on something quite important or a number of things actually, but one thing I just want to pick up on was when you are doing those rent rents or the to trying to take on those first deals, it can be quite tough getting that first deal. But actually what you're unaware of at that moment in time or what else may come from that one property. As I said, the landlord might have others, there are no other people. Mm-hmm. But you don't see that at the beginning. You like sold the seed and you're watering yet, nothing's happening. Yeah. So those first few months sometimes finding that first rent train can be quite tough. How do you keep pushing forward when you're constantly hitting no's? Because I'm uh, guessing you hit a lot of no's. I hit a lot of no's. I nearly gave up after the first three. So three months I hit. And so when I actually started my, my deal search or sourcing or whatever you want to call it, I hit no's for about three months. Right. Maybe I didn't work hard enough, but I think for me was 
I, I read this quote somewhere like you only you only one one no away or one yeah. yes away or something like that that you just you just you keep opening the doors you could be on a, the hundredth door is is the the deal and you're ninety ninth door and you can stop so I kept going I kept going that was the one of the things second thing was I learned how to in my job I learned a lot I had a lot of challenges and I was used to ex- accepting challenges I was used to like taking no's and tough times <laughs> hard times rejections and I said you know what I've I've had built up a really um for me it was my childhood my my teenager days i had a lot of no's i had a lot of rejections in in various things and i'm like i'm not failing i'm not failing yeah. and that mindset is the key it's just a to be an entrepreneur i think it's all about mindset and managing people yes that yeah absolutely you got to you got to believe in yourself you got to back yourself first before anybody else is ever going to back you yeah. if you're speaking to a potential landlord about taking a property on from them but you doubt yourself mm. That's going to come across. Exactly. They're not going to be comfortable about you taking on their property if you doubt yourself. Yeah. If you back yourself, then you've got a much better chance of that moving forward. Yeah, and, and it's always, for me, it was I was always making everything a win-win for whenever I've worked with you or people. I'm like, look, what, what are you winning from this? Because it's a value exchange. Yeah. People forget this. People are like, oh, I want to get the best deal. No, because it's not going to work long term. Yes. My what the, the deal I talked about, the first renter rent I got, that that gentleman is still with us. 2009-8-19 to, to, to 2023 yeah. same rent he's not even raised the rent in due recorder two bedroom apartment because he's just like and he was the hardest one to get yeah. because of the first one and he was like what is what is the service combination what is rent to rent and there's no track record yeah there's no track record it's a new company he went on company's house and checked and I said look I have this experience of managing people I have this experience of doing this in my corp and then relatable relatability yeah. so I, I, he was, a, I think he had, um, he's an engineer in in, in, a, in, a, in electrical engineering. So we suddenly connected. Yes. And that's how you build trust. Trust and credibility is one of the reasons I'm winning right now. I have built trust and now credibility. Yes. And I'm winning. I can proudly say sitting here that I'm winning because of this. And this guy, I want to just remember this. This guy is with us for four years. And I hardly talk to him. He just trust me. Yeah. Ren goes into the cow, doesn't raise the rent because he doesn't want to lose. Now the paper... The sides have switched now. The, 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 the tables have switched. He said, oh, he doesn't want to... If he raises rent, we might leave. Yes. And Rather than the, the fear is on the other side of the same. Correct. So people watching this, people need to understand, like, you have to literally believe in yourself, like you said, relate to people and build trust. Credibility. Yes, you got... If you got credibility, like yourself, you have credibility. You can... Most startups don't have credibility, but you can build that credibility in yes. six months. Doesn't have to be six years, and you can always leverage somebody else's credibility as well by aligning yourself with somebody else that has credibility and working with them to accelerate the, uh, the accelerate. Correct, joint ventures. Yeah, joint ventures is a way to also grow yourself and build credibility. And uh, if I, investment, sometimes people have an issue with where you're going to pay the rent from and how you're going to guarantee me the rent. Maybe you can have an investor that's there who's got a massive credibility. Sometimes people ask you for a bank account statement. Yeah. Right. If you can show that you'll sign a deal. Very easily, they might forget about everything. Just see money on paper, yeah. which means nothing to yeah. me. But join me. It's cash flow as opposed to correct uh, cash. So, talk me through then the process of okay, you've got that first one. Yeah. How do you go to 125 then? Uh, uh, you know, in in that in that time frame, and what are the challenges? So for me, I believe there are levels in life and in entrepreneurship or in a company. So that's level one. Level two is you need to get your operations people correctly st- done in a set up in your in your business or or, or whatever business rent to rent property you know uh, you know commercial so for me it was like two properties i've got now how can i scale the biggest fear was people think the first property is the biggest fear for me the biggest fear was how do i go from 2 to 200 or 2 to 2 to 25 you got to have a team got to people how do you hire people recruitment operation automations systems and processes make a business or break a business so from the second property, I started thinking about, oh, what channel manager, what operations I'm going to put. There's a lot of tools out there that do this for you. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of guidance, coaching out there yeah. online that do this for you. Like we use something called Guesty as a channel manager. They're very automated. They're very systems driven. They have their account manager that helps you, guides you. Um, you know, if you're taking X amount of payments, what you need to do. So we put pro- processes in place, ri- wrote down processes, mm-hmm. created systems, hired People, maybe not the right people at the start. Like, I want to be honest, like, I was give everyone an opportunity. Um, sorry, we're a results driven world. Welcome to planet Earth, right? We're a results driven uh, place. And I didn't really know that. These were, I learned a lot in the last three years. So I was hiring my mates, 
right? Your most valuable resource can be people, yes. but also can be your worst right. uh, resource as well. Walking around hunting <laughs> legs, very costly. And yeah, it cost me a lot. I lost a good few thousand pounds at the start because I hired ex uh, Mr. John and I said, you know, it was, his name wasn't Mr. John, but I hired Mr. John and I said, you know, look, God, do this for me. Yeah, yeah, we're going to do it. Three months later, there's no income generating from that actual role. Right. Right. And, and I was too shy or too embarrassed to even say to the guy, you know, we, there was no KPIs at the start. So I put in KPIs, key performance indicators, mm -hmm. key indicators. Key performance indicators are very important for a growth of a business from two units to 200 units, right? It's a little bit, the way I think about it, it's like uh, it's driving a car with no dashboard. Correct, yeah. How do you know what's going on? Yeah, yeah. So that your KPIs are your dashboard. It mm. shows you quick visually, where are we? Where's the issue? Yeah. You know, is the oil light on? Is there a problem? Are we running out of fuel? That's a very good way to put it. So right now what we have, or well, we had it from 2019, so after two or three properties, a dashboard where it says, you know, what's our occupancy levels? Um, the When's the rents going out? Um, what's the maintenance issues? Um, you know, what's a growth plan? Like we see all of this every week or if, if not every month, right? So we, we have a visual in front of us on a computer in the office. Uh, we have a different type of visual and we can see everything which is relatable to occupancy and revenue. So we have a weekly meeting, which we, I started this two years ago, a weekly meeting with my team. Even if it's two people yes. need that weekly meeting. Guys, where we are, where, where are we now and where do you want to get to? Yes. On a weekly basis. Right, I can do the yearly basis in the six monthly mm -hmm. thing. So uh, KPIs are very important for the growth from two units. Yeah, so you can do the strategic level, but on the ground, that needs to be rolled out uh, yeah. uh, as well. As entrepreneurs, we're very good at uh, you know coming up with the solutions and stuff and, and visualizing and being strategic mm -hmm. about things. And often we've, we're very poor at the, 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 the little detail of things. Mm -hmm. So you gave the classic example there of, look, I need some people here to help with this. Oh, he looks like he's capable. Just hire him and let him get on mm -hmm. with it. And we don't actually manage them or help them. We just expect them to produce the yeah, results. Yeah. So how, how did you then deal with some of those challenges to to improving the, the team from what you started with? So if I'm honest, I there were times I was doing really well. And then I had a, like a hit, a hit a wall because I hired the wrong people. Mm -hmm. So lesson learned. You need to really research in the people you're hiring. That's why interviews are important. I was the guy which I watched too many Instagram reels or TikToks. Oh, just, you know, give people opportunity to do this. Yes, but there's a reason there are interview processes to filter certain skill sets out, a certain experiences out. That's why when you're 16 years old and you're trying to get a job in a, a, in an office, they say, no, no experience. And when I was 16, I was like, come on, I can do this. Yeah. There's a reason because, you know, uh, you either go learn the experience somehow in a smaller company to get to this. Um, I didn't do that filtering process, didn't do the interview process, hired these people, and I learned it very quickly that I'm losing money, right? Mm -hmm. What I needed was a good mentor, a good coach, a good circle, a good network. So I, if I wasn't around people like yourself or other people that are good coaches, good friends, guys, Adam, you need to take a step back. This, this is not results driven. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're making money, but you could be making another £3,000 extra a month or 5000 so it was the people that made me realize, Adam, you got all these processes, but you haven't got it right with the people. So where are their one-to-ones? Where are you? How are you? Where, when are you doing the training? Or are they even trained? What experiences they're actually bringing in? Um, don't be afraid to challenge them. Create a challenge culture, uh, like positively. They challenge me, I challenge them, and it allows us to grow. So yeah, I created that, the right network, and uh, right mentors who helped me get the right people in uh, yeah. after that, uh, when I hit the wall. So if somebody's looking to start out in rent to rent now, uh, or rent to service accommodation, um, would you say the systems and processes need to go in at the beginning, or you start rolling them out as you grow, or they evolve? I would say they need to go in in your first property. Put them in. You may not use them. Put your systems and processes in the first place. So I'll give you an example of system and processes. When we set up, we, in last summer we set up fifty-five units in two weeks. How did we set up fifty-five two-bedroom apartments in one building? rightly so but how do we do that we have a, breaking this down we have a sh an excel sheet which says exactly which lamp from where you're going to get it how many do you need yes um how you're going to fund it like it's all there so it's not me ordering it now it's my team so i pass that sheet on mm -hmm. i said it clearly says what you need to do 55 times that's your process there this is how you order it that's the lead time and that's the day it's going to come so that's one example of a setup then when the delivery comes there's a process of we have a visual this is how the room looks like for a two bed. And this is how a room looks like for a one bed. It's, it's like a, a mass factory. So like this one to every, all to, for one week, 
the team just goes out and just puts the same thing in the same place um in this in the same uh, apartment um every time so it's like a clear a flow of uh, process so yeah. if you did that on your first property yeah okay it's gonna take you five minutes to do it but you got it there now you can scale to 10 if someone offered you 10 your 10 properties yes because you've built it right from the offset yeah. scaling up is much easier rather than trying to figure it out as mm-hmm. as we go along yeah talk to me about that 55 unit deal so so when i got one or two units single 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 apartments you know like i said i'm very ambitious i said okay i've done that now what's next um, for me, that's that's my driver. I'm like, okay, I need to achieve the level seven I- in this game, yes. right? So developers, so start working with developers directly with developers. I built up the credibility that I talked about earlier. Credibility now comes into play. You leverage that credibility. Say, look, Mister Mister Developer, I have 25 units. So you don't even have to have 10. You have to have yes. five units, but you can show that you have good systems and good processes and good income. You're actually profitable. Show your accounts. And you present that your approach again it's not easy yeah hundreds of people are doing this but you go there your approach you set yourself apart you create a usb unique selling point look you know i have we have this experience as a team which maybe the other company doesn't have but we have a first line management x y and z we have a good cleaning system so your properties are going to stay good we have a good mani- uh, maintenance management where it means your team uh, your your apartments are going to stay in good condition we go this is what i did approach multiple landlords we had no's no we can't work with you too small you know, you only have 30 properties or 35 properties. No, we've done this before. This is after COVID, by the way. So a lot of developers were burnt and built to rent. Yes. And one, two developers that stuck with us took us four and a half months to close the deal. Wow. Four and a half months. The first, one of the directors and company said, no, there's no way we're doing this, right? And this is facts. We said, look, what's the key was, anytime we get rejected in a deal, ask the question, oh, wait, this is sales. What can I do to make this deal work for you? simple this is the question i still remember asking i said look mr john i want to know what, what what's what's stopping you not doing this deal because you're going to get 100k a month our net our rent every month is about 100k mm-hmm. like that's just that's just expenses and rest yeah. <laughs> like i've got to think about this i'm like okay if you're sitting on the other side if i'm offering 100k for your block mm-hmm. you gotta you, you're not gonna just say no you gotta think yeah. about it said i don't have to go hire a leasing manager to to go find single tenants to fill these units up so eventually the guy took took a step back and said, okay, cool. You know what? Come into the office. Show me what operation. See, show me what processes you've got. Show me how you run your operations. Because he was a six-year-old man who's been in property yeah. for years and he's been in operations. So like I said earlier, if you start with your first property operation system, you're already in that mindset mm-hmm. to answer this question. You're not panicking. I'm like, this is bread. This is my bread and butter. Just went in there, dressed up, put a suit on, went in there, you know, uh, turned up on time. I said, look, um, this is what we do. Talked about my corporate experience in this as well. He said, oh, that's good. So you seem like you know how to run a business. So they said, okay, let me speak to my other director on the board. Yeah. It's, a, it's a big company. So they have uh, they have multiple blocks around around the country. Um, so that was the start of the, of the, of that deal. And then back and forth, contract negotiations. They said, okay, we can't give you, we can't give you 100 units. I, I'm always playing big. I said, I want 100. I think there are 435 units in that building. Okay. But... I should have gone for 435, but I, I went for 100. <laughs> and they, if I went for only eggs in one basket as well. <laughs> yeah. But look, my point is, I went for 100 and he gave me 55, or I think it's 50. Yeah. If I went for 435, they might have given me yeah, 200. Yeah. <laughs> for me, I always say this get get the deal. You can work out the finance and you can work out the, the solution to run the deal the next week or the day after. Yes. Right? And you probably agree with this. Uh, it has worked for me for the last yeah. uh, four years. Because if you if you think you can't get the deal, if you can't make the deal work, you're never going to get a deal of the 55 yeah. or the 10 yeah. because you're thinking too small. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. There's a number of times that we've done property deals where we've done it because we know it's a good deal. We've committed to it. We've no idea how we're going to finance it and complete mm-hmm. it, but we know it's a good deal. Yeah. So we'll find a way to do it. Yeah. When we say it's a, we, we know it's a good deal, we have done our numbers. Like, yeah. you know, we've done the numbers. We're like X, Y, Z, occupancy at 85% will give us this money. You just times in that by 150 or 200 units um and i that was a lesson for me then i'm always learning i'm a student um there what i didn't do is think think bigger think i think it's big enough for most people but i say to people think bigger bigger as you can yes if if that's what you want so yeah so that was the deal for me where we signed the contract in four months they said okay cool and they gave us a trial period Okay. You got to agree. So sometimes so people, you invested a lot of money to yeah. get them all kitted out. Yeah. But you're on a trial. Seventy thousand pounds it cost me to kit out. That was that, so I went from 
single units, right? Single landlords, which is cost what four thousand pounds for, and uh, suddenly have to raise finance. So, uh, in two years, I've built up that trust with a lot of people. Networking is the more. I'm, I'm a I'm a serial networker. Serial networker. At Dubai. I was in. I was flying business class bag. I only fly business class because I network. Yes. And people uh, you meet along the way. Yeah. Along the way, because the people always want to mingle. They're all corporate or business uh, or entrepreneurs mm. in business class. So. I find a lot of investors there. So I was like, I can get investments. Get me the 55 units, 70,000 to set up, the set of the furniture and stuff. Yeah. The next day I presented a deal to one of my old um, co colleagues. She she worked with me in Jaguar Land Rover. Okay. Can you imagine? I presented it to her and she was like, I don't I'll take this right now. 10% yeah. return. 10% okay. return. Yeah. I didn't have a chance to put it on Instagram or, or on Facebook to yeah. say, oh, does anyone want to invest? That's how powerful. That's the person you presented it to said, yeah. I'll do it. Because as you know, deal. If the deal's good, people will invest. Because they 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 believed in that it's not this building. It's the tallest building in in Birmingham. They were like, this is never gonna fail. Yeah. Like it's brand new. Uh, it's got a cinema. It's got a running track. So people are gonna come there. And it's it's been one year. Now we're sitting at one year on yes. working, and we're about to extend the contract for four years. Excellent. So, I want to say one thing about doing big deals. It's like sometimes there's a lot of back and forth. It's not as what you see on on YouTube or social yes. media. It's like they might have their, because they have the leverage. They're the one, that's the a 500 million pound company. They're like, okay, cool. We can only give you a trial, but we're giving you a step in. Yes. So don't be afraid. Don't just stick to trying to make it work. As I said, make it win-win for everyone because you need to risk medicate. They they have they have their KPIs. Yes. And we have our own KPIs, but try and meet in the middle and you can make things work. Yes. And then what was then the, the move to start doing other cities in the UK? Because this is all Birmingham we're talking about. Um, the move was the belief that I said, oh, I can do this now. Someone else has believed in me. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it, it's, it's tough that it's taken me, to, someone else to believe in me to move into other city. Uh, I was like, oh, a big company is believing in my company now. So like I can take this across. It is with the same developer because they now, they said, you know, we have X uh, Liverpool, we have Glasgow, we have Hove in down south, uh, you know, we're building another one in Manchester and Leeds. And what do you think of that? So once you build up the credit, once you build up the rapport and the relationship, this is four months, I said, this is not all one phone call or one email. Four months of going back, I've traveled up to Leeds office. And they said, like, you know, these guys are serious. They've shown us the funds. Mm -hmm. They did ask to see the funds. Um, you know, all of these little things led into them making a phone call back to me. Say, okay, now we signed this contract. How about this, Adam? Yes. People are liking this. People in the team with the management are saying, okay, this, this, is, this could work. This could, it's about making their life easier. Yeah. Put yourself in a developer's shoes. They're like, we. they have a KPI of getting 90% occupancy to build to rent. Mm -hmm. They have to get occupancy to satisfy their investors. Mm -hmm. So how how can you make it easy for them to get 90% occupancy? Someone, one client yeah. pays the bills. Yeah. You got, they're basically 100% occupancy so, so, on that portion. Correct, yeah. yeah. So I decided to take on the offer, moved into Liverpool. We got, I think, four to 17 units in Liverpool yeah. with the same developer. Uh, Glasgow, we moved into, and takes me into Dubai at the same time it was in expanding to Dubai so just a belief to I, I, my vision I have set a goal five year goal like yes. you know international and done it so the the various cities around the country have been because the door opened with one developer it actually opened up opportunities in other cities for yeah. you as well and because I'm guessing they're giving you multiple units you can then build a team around that mm -hmm. because uh, so having cleaners for example on the ground and stuff if you've got one unit it's much more difficult if you're taking 10 20 in one place yeah it's much easier to build a team around that i always say it, it's easier to do a two million pound deal than a twenty thousand pound deal yes it's much easier because you know exactly um you know how many people you need to get how, how you need to scale you got it is the work is the same for me um i needed more people more paperwork but the work was the same so yeah it's when, he, when the bigger it was, the better it was for us. In Dubai, you started off with one unit initially. Was that to just kind of test the market and stuff? With Was the ambition always to grow more there? Or was it a case of, well, let's just go and do one and see what happens? That was born out. Dubai international business was born out of COVID because we were in lockdowns. Everyone yeah. knows how property market uh, in terms of service apartments and hotels was closed. Yeah. And for me, I don't like losing. I can't lose. There, and it's actually not that easy this it's actually not that hard to win because if you put your mind to it even if there's lockdown even with the government you don't like the government you don't like this the economy inflation you can there's opportunities yes so when the lockdown happened i said what which country is open so dubai was the only country that was open for business and for tourism mm -hmm. i decided to take a flight on the third lockdown that happened here 
and I said, let me explore the market. I didn't just take my first unit the first day. Okay. Let me research the market. Let me see what are the what are the the, the, the risks, uh, what are the opportunities uh, available here. So totally different market to to UK. It's licenses, permits, you know, regulated, fully regulated markets. You can't just go get a rent to rent. Right. Like you need to have a permit number which is registered against your passport, registered against your company. You've got to have investment of £10,000 to get a license. Mm -hmm. It's not free. You have to pay 10, up to £10,000. You get a visa. You get your license to operate as, as, a, as a service department company or as, as, as whatever business you're doing. Yes. So I spent about two months doing my market research, benchmarking. Um, there's a lot of blue chip companies there, big boys companies that have 1,000 units. You know, right. We're talking, we're competing with corporations now. Um, it's, it's scary. But yeah, at the same time, it gives you opportunities to target a market that they're not targeting because they're so big, right? Because we can provide a one-to-one -one customer service 24 hours a day and all of that stuff, all the good stuff of customer journey. So what we did, I decided to say, look, you know, I can take to register this company, invest 10,000 pounds and take two units on, Yeah, you know? And we're still talking 2021 when Dubai tourism was booming and it really paid off. From two to I went, I did a lot of management model. I did the management model there. Went to a lot of landlords and said, look, we can take 15%, 18% and manage this for you and get you mm -hmm. uh, extra 20% on, on service apartment. Yeah. So we didn't do rent to rent. We did the revenue share management model with all the owners that were buying or had the units in Dubai in tourist areas. I scale from one or two to 27 now uh, in Dubai, yeah. just doing the management. I have some rent to rents, but this, the quick you can scale really quickly if you do the management model. Yes. And then that created leverage back into UK that now we're international bidders with 27 units. So now, if you take, if you go back to the same developer, suddenly in one year we have a, a business in Dubai, and the growth is incredible. Yes. Um. So, and that was that was the reason the lockdown and the COVID, where I couldn't lose, and I said I have to make this work. So with the uh, COVID, I mean, it was a, a a shock to the system for many service accommodation operators. A good shock to the system. And, you know, we we found it tough as well. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, we came through it, uh, like yourself. But there were some operators that just shut up shop and yeah. just ran for the hills because they just couldn't sustain it. Um, so how did you survive that and what 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 did that teach you going through that process? I learned a lot from there. It, it, it was the worst time. Um, I didn't have much of a team. It was the worst time of my life when I remember going home and my mom saying to me, why did you leave your Jagger Land Rover job? Like, yeah. she was I right. told you not to give up yeah. that job. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. she said, why did you leave your nice job with a nice car? Um, rightly so, she's right. Yeah. You know, time, like I couldn't, I was thinking tough where I'm tough times. And, it doesn't help, like, you know, but uh, she was right in a way, but I was like, no, but it's so what I'm left, I'm, I'm here now, I'm going to make this work. The mindset is I can't lose, yeah. I can't lose, everyone's closing shop. If everyone's closing shop, that means I have the opportunity to take over the market yeah. when it opens, right? That's the difference between successful entrepreneurs and the people who, do, who don't who don't have that mindset. You've got to have that mindset that you can't lose, yeah. right? Because it's not actually, as I said before, it's not uh, hard to win. If you put your mind to it, you can really win. Like maybe not 100 million, but you can at least make a million, you know? Yes. So I still remember going back and my mom saying, you know, I said, mom, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to find a way. So what did we do and there and then? I approached a lot of hospitals. If you like yourself, you've probably done that. I did. I, 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 what I did was, you know, cover the rent, yeah. cover the expenses. So we don't close down. Yeah. Don't make, yeah. I mean, the same thing, what we did to focus on NHS market. Yeah. Don't really make any money, but at least we stay open. Correct, yeah. yeah. And the landlords were like, oh, so this ex-operator gave the unit back, but you can take that unit now because at least you're paying my rent. And that's when I realized, I was like, oh, that was just one guy who said that to me. I was like, oh, I can do this. I can keep satisfying all of these investors and landlords yeah. and really just stay afloat. Any hard times are coming now. Right now, we're going to get, we're getting into recession. You know, uh, business are going to shut down. Inflation is high. Unemployment is going to go high. Um, and a lot of people are going to lose. A lot of lazy people are going to lose. Yeah. A lot of people who don't measure the business are going to lose. Um, last month in Birmingham or in the whole of UK, occupancy levels are very low. Mm. People are shutting down. Yes. We're going through the same cycle again. And if you can see that there is opportunity in this and just not cry about it, that's what I say. People yeah. complain, don't complain about it. And you can win. When it comes to doing service accommodation in Dubai yeah. versus the UK, what do you see the, as the differences in terms of the the operations, the people, the guests? Yeah, so two things. The, the, first of all, the business and the people. Um, there's a work ethic I find is much, much higher. Um, not to say that people don't work hard here. The work ethic is higher. It's because the, the culture that these people are growing. So there's a lot of, a lot of um, Asian co workers, Pakistani, Indians, um, they're working. Air servicing the market in yeah. all service market in Dubai 
Filipinos, Indians, and Pakistanis are working and they're building the service market. Their work ethic is is 100% to 200%. They work really hard for a lot less money than what people get paid here. And when you see that, you see the hard work in the heat of 50 degrees. They're putting the hard work cleaners, you know, construction workers, um, service market, hotel waitresses, waiters. They're putting this work in every day, sink day, day out. When, and what that means is as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, I've got these people that yeah. are doing this work. We pay them very well. We pay all of these international workers very well. But the work ethic, they're always delivering what you ask them to deliver. In turn, you get better performance as a customer output yeah. uh, to your customer, customers and your tourist market. People are satisfied. Our reviews are five star. And one of the that was the biggest difference I saw. I was like, you know... There are very some very good employees that we have and in in the country, right? But the work ethic is not the same that you get in 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 these countries, and that's been the biggest difference in the, in, the, in the success of the Dubai market. So you were born in uh, Pakistan, and yeah. what age did you come to UK? I was fourteen years old. Fourteen. Yeah. And so you've kind of experienced a few different cultures earlier on uh, as well. Um, and h- how did you how did you find that transition? If I'm honest, I found it very difficult. But that difficulty is why I'm sitting here across you right now. That difficulty taught me how to get over the challenges and the the hardship. I grew up in a council state in Birmingham, rough, went to a very rough school, come from a, a decent school in Pakistan, and I come here and it was rough. I was worried about getting stabbed, right? That's how bad it was. And I used to go home, cry, and I think, why, what, what am I doing in this country? Yeah. Like, but then, you know, you people, honestly, one of the biggest things I say to my friends and people is we got to stop complaining. This this country, how bad do people think it is, is better than a lot of countries in terms of opportunities. I just gave an example earlier. It costs ten thousand pounds to start a business in Dubai. How much does it cost here to start a business? A registered company's ass a few quid and you're done. So, you know, if you're trying to be an entrepreneur, you haven't got ten thousand pounds in Dubai or in the country or bureaucracy or in some third world countries is bribing if you haven't got this. Yeah. Here it's fair game from a- yeah. average level is fair game. I think people often don't recognise how big the opportunity is for us here. Yeah. In terms of within a country where you can build empires if you want exactly there is no glass ceiling you can create whatever yeah. you want if you've got that drive and ambition to want to most people don't they do not have that drive and what it takes to kind yeah. of keep going because they're sacrifices as well if you're if you're that way driven and that way inclined yeah exactly so you're still a young guy not married no kids uh enjoying the the laptop lifestyle of traveling the world um how do you think life might change when you settle down at some point and kids come along? That's a very good question. Um, I'm a very driven person, so I am a bit worried if I keep keep driven so much, how I'm going to manage a family life. But I think I'm putting in things in place. So I'm buying businesses now. So I'm, I'm in an acquisitions and mergers uh, industry now, also property, you know, the servicing. So multiple businesses, I'm trying to create safe investments and assets. I also buy, keep buying like buy to less and commercial. I'm all creating all of this so I can take a step back, maybe say, okay, you know, 10 million, 25 million turnover is, is okay now, you know, net profit of X, I'm okay. Like, I, I don't need to keep chasing the, the stars. Um, So we're building, it's a massive goal. We're building a hundred million pound group after, you know, uh, acquiring all these companies that we acquire, plus the service accommodation, plus my, my assets of commercials and buy to let. So... That's my goal, and it's an achievable goal. You 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 buy companies, you know, you you grow your service accommodation business to a twenty five million, and your company is valued a hundred million, uh, and you can exit. So I'm looking to exit after seven years to a private equity firm, yes. right? To to you create value and make a sellable company, and then I have this this money or the assets where maybe I don't need to work as hard yeah. or as much because I kind of done it for ten years. So. I know I'm aware, I'm very self-aware the life would change when you have kids. So I'm I'm looking forward to it yeah. very positively because I would I, I truly believe I'm I'm two hundred percent confident that I would have built something. I've I can live comfortably now, but I choose not to because I don't have the kids and the family. Yeah. So when I do, I will be able to take a step back. So uh, is your mom actively looking for somebody or should we uh, <laughs> run an advert right now with another yeah. <laughs> I think I'm I've, kidding. I've got enough options. <laughs> so you talked about a number of other properties strategies as well. So primarily you've been doing self accommodation, but you touched on buy to let and commercial. Tell us about some of the other type of property stuff you've been involved in. Well, buy to let are the, the the easy bed and brother. I would say you know you 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 get it you get it, you get a buy to let mortgage and you let it run and just it's not big money but pays 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 the bills right. The biggest thing the biggest deal I've done to life today 
in, from an asset point of view was the commercial deal that you helped me with. Okay. And I don't think you remember it, but it was that one phone call I made in 2020. I, and, I remember vaguely <laughs> discussing the deal. And, and, and if I break this down in numbers to your audience, this is, this is why the network and the mentoring is so powerful. Like I was part of your, your group, you know, I could call you up, you would answer your phone because you're my mentor and you know, you help me, you have your own academy where you help people. I, I was able to ring you and gladly so had you in my network to ask if it was a very distressed deal. Uh, if I, if I go back to the deal. I, seller with distress. Seller with distress in COVID. Yeah. Everything was shut. He lost a job, classic situation, lost a job. It was a, a shop with two uh, residential units, convert, converted shop, right? Um, and he was willing to sell because he needed the cash. He bought it in 2001. Okay. So he knew the value of the of the property, but he was willing to take 140,000 mm. pounds in, in Smedic. This deal is just betting. It's worth, at that time, it was worth 250. I My my mindset wasn't that strong and, until it was, if it was for you, because he was so distressed. It was so bad. I said, if I buy this deal, I will lose 140,000 pounds of my savings. I didn't want to get an investor in one. I'll put my own savings of cash. I bought it cash. You can, no one will mortgage it. Yeah. I rang you up and you said, do X, Y, and Z. And if that says green light, buy it because that's how you get the best deals in the world. And I still remember going to my lawyer. Even my solicitor said, don't buy this deal. Yeah. They're very cautious by nature, the solicitors. I know. didn't know that. But you've got to look at where, the, where you see the opportunity. Yeah. So I didn't know. I thought, because he's a solicitor, 55 years old, he knows everything. He's done. He's a corporate solicitor, a commercial solicitor. And he was like, Adam, if I was you, you're a young guy, don't get involved. It's COVID. You know, everyone's losing. And this is before the boom in the market as well the COVID uh, boom and the, and, uh, and then I called you and you said, Adam, do X, Y, and Z. I did X, Y, and Z, looked at the paperwork, pushed, pushed the green button. I said, Mr. Mr. Solicitor, buy the, um, I want to buy this. I want to complete in the, within the week because I know now someone else can come yeah. and take this deal because it's such a good. At that point, you recognize how good the deal was. That's the yeah. point. And it was that one phone call for 10 minutes. I think it was 15 minutes you went through. And I, was, I still remember I was just, just got home and you just went through the whole thing. So having the powerful network and the education of 20 years of experience of someone else can change and and make you 250,000. I would give break the numbers down for you. I bought that for 140, applied for planning permission, tenanted as well, cash flow from day one. I was worried about why if they don't pay me rent, but when I had the network and I had the knowledge, what, what if they don't pay me rent, I know what processes and procedures to follow. And I took those steps before I bought the, bought the deal. The tenants were like, oh, this guy knows what he's talking about. We'll pay rent from day one. Day one, I got paid. Till today, I'm still getting paid rent. Same tenants, happy, loving. I got refurbs done in it. Bought it for 140. Applied for planning permission with the well-known architect that we all use uh, within Birmingham. He done done me a done a really good plan. Approved in three months. Bank just valued it at half a million. Wow, Fantastic. half a million pounds is valued in two, 20, 20, three years. Three years, half a million. So 140, I bought it for. Yeah. Obviously, build costs and whatnot. Cash flowing for day one, three thousand pound cash flowing. Right, build half a million. Very good. And so you're doing more uh, property stuff, or you're focusing now more on the M and own stuff right now, the mergers, acquisitions, uh, acquiring other businesses. For me, my I think my drive now is, and and people need to realize, like sometimes goals change, passion changes. So property is good. Buying assets, uh, background, I'll buy a property, I'll buy this. If someone bring me a commercial deal today, I'll buy it. Commercials are the best way for me. Uh, commercial conversions, or just a commercial that's running with a tenant. Um, so I'm buying properties where there is a good deal available. Personally, we haven't found a very good deal in the last six to eight months. Maybe I haven't looked hard enough. So that's why I'm in m and building up businesses, growing business in Dubai, international market, mm -hmm. leveraging, creating the credibility, creating the credibility allows you to get finance in the future for private equity, allows you to banks to finance you. Three years, four years on, I'm getting calls from banks to commercial finance, yeah. one million pounds. And when you, when you understand that environment and how it works, because you mentioned earlier, maybe an exit in seven years, because you recognize, well, actually, you know, uh, if I'm doing uh, two and a half million a year in, in the service accommodation business, I could sell that for 10 million. Yeah. Uh, somebody will, will pay that money and buy it from day one yeah. uh, from me. Uh, and that then translates into, okay, what other businesses could I apply the same method and form? Exactly, in? exactly. So we've been, we, we've been allowed a property market, property people, property entrepreneurs, but I think, it's a transferable skill or you can combine it, build a sellable business. So I'm building a business, the way I structure the process and operation, sellable. So when you come to me and I say to you it's worth 10 million, you're going to ask me, how does it run? Can you run without you, Adam? Yeah. So that's, that's the most important question that people yeah. forget to think about. Yeah. It needs to run without you. Yeah, and then that's what gives the 10 million pounds, um, uh, that 10 million pound value or the 20. So yeah. we've, 
within the next two years, my target is 20 million. This should be worth 20 million. I worked on a plan of how that's going to be worth 20 million. Obviously, you have the contracts. Yes. Have the people, have the first line management. That's what people are buying into, the experience and the operations. So I'm in the M&A world now because I can see how this is all relatable. The money mindset is so important. Like we're going through a phase in the market where more millionaires are going to be made, but a lot of people are going to be unemployed at the same time. You choose which side you want to be on. Yes. If you're a young guy like myself or even younger than me, a 25, 26 guys, you cannot be in a better position right now as a 20. There's going to be huge upheaval in the next year. There's no yeah. doubt about that. And uh, the opportunities are going to be there for those that recognize them. And many people just batten down the hatches and yeah. say, just leave me alone. And, yeah. and you know, like you said, you've got to make the choice which yeah. side of the, the fence you want to be on. Exactly. So you want to, you, the people are going to get their mindset right. Right now is a time that a lot, as I said, lazy people are going to lose. People who are complaining are going to lose, who are complaining about inflation are going to lose because inflation creates opportunities. Use it. Like, you know, it's basically the people listening to us who want to be entrepreneurs or are entrepreneurs. Guys, we're going to win now. Yes. You know, explore, go go to a different country. Like I went to Dubai. It's not just Dubai. You can try Spain, uh, you know, uh, uh, places which are like upcoming, like, you know, upcoming opportunities. Uh, there are businesses where people invest in properties in places in Dubai. Yeah, there are a lot of emerging markets. Emerging there's markets. risks as well, but there's huge upsides in some places yeah. as well. And, you know, when you're young, free and single, that's the time it's easier to do that. Yeah. When you're committed, uh, you know, family, high paid job, mortgage, mm. You know, it's much more difficult to make those uh, steps. Exactly. So easy to take risk for me now. Yeah. Um, even if you have kids, you can create assets where you have some f f fixed income. So you can, you know, take some risk. So there are still ways to do it as you do it yourself now. You know, you're a family man. You take risk. You, if you're not taking risk, you won't be in this. Risk, risk mitigation, as you mentioned earlier. Correct. There's always risk. But how do you protect your downside? Yeah. In terms of your M&A, what type of business are you looking at? What's the what's the uh, the recent acquisition you've just done? So... M and A. I look into different industries. Like I'm very keen on like waste management and engineering, where I come from. Factories, you know, operational driven companies, which I'm looking at. This takes times. The deal pipeline is exactly the same. How we get a rent to rent, you know, you have to go and keep approaching owners. But the one that's come through for us in Dubai, which was a real estate company, real estate brokerage, real estate agency, you call it in the UK. So it's like a, an estate agency. Correct. Uh, okay, yeah. So we just the model there is very different to the UK. Correct, yes. Yeah. So we just acquired uh, a 2017 formed company, a small boutique real estate agency in Dubai. The model is very different. You're talking very big numbers. You're talking like selling Sunset, if people are yeah. seeing selling Sunset on Netflix. You're talking, if I was selling a 10 million pounds villa in Dubai on the Palm, Oh, they're not actually, they're like 35 million pounds. You know, you're selling this, you're getting 2% commission of that. Yeah, you can make, you sell that, you build a connect, you build, all you need to do is find one owner, yes. build a rapport, market it, market it in the correct way, find an investor. More investors are available. The Russians are coming, the, yes. the Americans, the UK, the Indians, Indians are 45% of the investors in the real estate market right. in Dubai, yeah. right? There's a, we're talking big money here. So you can sell a 10 million pound deal in five days if you've got the right connection. Mm -hmm. 2%. You know, oh, some places you can get four percent. You're talking about two, three hundred k in one deal. Yes. So the when you when you look at that and the uh, the UK estate agent market, they're probably the poorest paid yeah. <laughs> agents and brokers in the world. But yeah, absolutely, place like uh, Dubai where the model is such is very uh, the 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 brokers are really incentivized yep. to make things happen. And how how do you find the Dubai culture generally for business? You've been living there for a while. Is it? Is it all it's made out to be like, you know, the glamorous lifestyle and... Uh, it depends which which glass you're looking at it from. You know, if you're a family man, probably not. You don't want the glamour that, you know, people see. Um, I'm trying to be a mature family man now, so I don't really want to be in, 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 in nightclubs or beach clubs. And, you know, you got to take a step back from all these glamours, all the fancy cars sometimes. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm an engineer, I love the cars, but it brings a different kind of attention sometimes, different kind of circle. Um, so you really got to be very powerful in your mind to be able to separate the riffraff of the Lamborghinis, yeah. but at the same time being the Lamborghini Drive Club or the Ferrari Club that I want to be and I go into and I have access to. So I, I'm hanging out with a lot of very famous influencers or, or good, hardworking people, entrepreneurs. It's very easy to do that in Dubai. So yeah. yes, it is what is made out to be. You can really connect. You can be sitting in a room with some amazing uh, seven-figure people or people who built a massive business very quickly because it's such a such a small a small place and if you're the right the right people people will connect you very quickly it's a very positive mindset but at the same time there's a lot of negatives uh, if you're just going out for the for the for the glam you know you've got to be really careful <laughs> you got you're you're born a millionaire you're gonna run out of money very quick so it's very expensive my expenses are ten thousand pound a month just living there 
as a single person yeah. living out there. Rent is London prices, four or five thousand pounds. My car, I just bought a new car. You know, that's what I wanted. Yeah. I can afford it. But if, if a person who wants just to Dubai live, just want to take pictures, you know, it's it's a holiday place. Yeah. Unless you've got a very stable income. You need a, you need a really good income there to be able yeah. to live and sustain yeah. a, a lifestyle. There. So I built a multiple business and so multiple stream of incomes. We talk about you got I be, until I did that I didn't really settle in Dubai. You probably only recently seen me properly settle. I was living still living in the UK because I can. Yeah. Because you travelled a little bit in the last uh, year or so as well. Yeah. So one of the goals I had when I got my first renter in, I want to be travel. I want to have I want to travel for lifestyle freedom. I was in Bali for two months, mm -hmm. so kind of ticked that off as well. Went into Pakistan for a month, traveled there, and then back to Dubai. Hard work, so I'm very, I'm very laser focused on my goals. Yeah. Um, whilst I, I still enjoy. It. So a lot of people think I just work, work, but I enjoy my life as well. Yes. And what do you see as the next three years, five years uh, look like for you? How do you see that panning out? For me, I keep it simple: five years, hundred million pounds group of various companies in various industries, and looking to exit five to seven years uh, to a private PE firm, private equity firm, uh, whether. Uh, you know, like I might, but I will build this service accommodation company to 20 to 25 million within the five years. And it's a compounding effect from now to the 25 million or the 100 million. Yes. Five years, I also see building a great team. I want to help people. I want to help create an operational team of 50 to 100 people in different countries or like Dubai in the UK. And, and I'm somewhat there, 25% there. That's my personal goal. It satisfies me to someone else to become a manager and, and become a director in the company, or whether they're in cleaning department or management department, they're 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 achieving their goal. They're putting bread on their table because of me. Like it's something easy to forget. With one renter, and I had no team now. I have a team of twenty people. Like you know, I've created twenty jobs, and I'm proud to sit here and say I've created twenty jobs. It satisfies me. So that twenty needs to go up to hundred people. So a hundred million pound company, a group. Uh, and looking to exit five to seven years. And during this time of uh, moving from a, a corporate job to building a business and starting to grow that now and yeah. moving into M&A, what do you think have been uh, some of the key learnings uh, along the way? Uh, number one, again, it goes back to I chose to be with the right people around me. I have a handful of people that I can count who are going to get me there, who are a part of it now. Mm -hmm. But I have four people um, who are literally on a level where they're operating at, which it's similar to mine. If not better, it's mostly better. It has to be better than what I won't learn. I don't like to be the smartest person in the room. Yeah. And then, and it's, it's those four, three people are literally going to propel me uh, to get to that to that to that level that I want to get to it. One of the reasons I'm in Dubai because there's more of those type of people there. Yes. Um, unfortunately, not here so much because of the environment. But it is those people that took me uh, from my corporate job to here. So just before we finish, if we think about somebody that might be watching or listening to this right now and they're thinking about getting started in property, they're not quite sure, you know, whether it's the right time, they should, they shouldn't, strategies they should use. What would you say to somebody like that who's kind of on the fence or whether they should or shouldn't get started in property? For me, if if everyone's scared, which people are right now, I think that's the right time. As I said, COVID was the scariest time. Mass, uh, everyone was scared in COVID, and that's when I made my money. That's when I got the lifestyle freedom. That's when I got the passive income mm -hmm. to double and triple, right? So start now there's never a right time to start you know life's too short start now but get the right mentors listen to uh, all the free education that's out there put yourself in the right group don't just go to networking events for the sake of networking don't go to networking events for the sake of it you need to go to events and work out who's going there like i usually network before the networking events. i find out which people are going through social media you know so i know what caliber of people are going which networking events work the best so put yourself in the position start today at least start learning. Educate yourself. Invest money in education. Uh, it, you know, be around the right people and, uh, and it can work. It, it, there's no right time to start. It's always always the right time to start today. Adam, thank you so much no for your problem. time. Really appreciate giving your time. And oh, Thank you very much for having me on. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.